Good morning. I'm gonna do this. I always look in the screen for some reason. You think after all these years of making videos, I'd know not to look at the screen, but I don't. What does it say? Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. I still feel pretty fatigued and tired. And I think it's the session that we did on Saturday, a really long session. Um, so I, was str I struggled at the gym today. I really didn't feel like my normal self, but. Anyway, try and get an extra hour of sleep. Keep kicking on. But today we've got, um, we're filming the last YouTube that we will sh post this year, which is pretty exciting. Um, I think it's actually the last YouTube that we'll shoot in this studio as well. And it's going to go live on Christmas Day, which is an, a really interesting time to post. And I don't, I don't know, well, I've never posted on Christmas Day before. I don't know how it's going to go. Um, so we're going to try and do something a little bit different. We're going to basically do a, like a, how I'd put a charcuterie board together. I think that, that timing kind of works. Um, but we'll get Caitlin involved and, you know, we might do a little bit of like, you know, a little bit of kind of, bit more banter than normal. Because I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that on Christmas Day don't have, for whatever reason, don't have family that they can hang out with or because they're living in the other part of the world or, you know, they're just, you know, for whatever reason, they don't have family. So I'm, I'm guessing on that, on that day, it's probably pretty... Um, can be pretty rough for some people so hopefully we can make something that's kind of light-hearted and um you know even if we can take you know make someone's day a little bit better um then it's worth doing so yeah we'll keep it a pretty light-hearted today but it should be pretty fun um yeah and then one other thing that i wanted to talk about today i'm just looking at my clock see if i've got enough time to do it now is someone asked a good question they said you know tell us about your journey through food and looking at my clock, I probably don't have enough time. But what I'm going to do is maybe this afternoon, I'll sit down, turn the camera on, and we'll run you through that. Because um, I get asked it a bit, and you know my career was pretty varied. Anyway, we won't get into that now. I'm going to eat my brekkie, uh, go have a shower. Crew will get here. We'll start getting ready to film this YouTube. Um, I'll probably turn the camera on for some of that and then this afternoon we'll sit down and I'll talk you all through my career from when I left high school to where I am now. Well hello, apologies, I, uh, I completely forgot to uh, excuse me, pick up the camera while we were shooting at YouTube because um, they're, they're pretty all-encompassing and you, you know, I'm pretty focused on uh, making them as engaging as possible. But we got the YouTube done and then I had to duck home because um, I just did an interview and so I wanted to do it here because the internet here is way faster than it is at the other place and it's kind of really annoying when you're doing interviews with people and it's kind of cutting in and out. Um, but as promised, I, there was a question around my career and, and where I've been and what I've done so I thought since you know I'm home by myself and well ducks over there he's asleep. Um, He's not actually feeling very well, poor ducky. He's a bit worse for wear. I don't know why, what's wrong with him. But... You alright, mate? No, poor ducky. Um, cause I've, definitely, I've kind of explained it before, but probably not, or not for a while, and not on, definitely not on this, in this new format of vlog. So, the Andy Cook's uh, career, where he's been and what he's done. So I was born in New Zealand um, and I, uh, I went to chef school in Auckland Chefs Hotel and Training College where I studied level four cookery. Uh, from there, I left there and went into the cafe scene in New Zealand. So I was pretty young. I, I went to chef school when I was 16 and you only did a year when I was there. So it was like a year intensive full-time course and then you're a qualified chef, which is, you know, kind of a joke really, but um, so be it. But I went to the cafe scene. So cafe, if you're not in New Zealand or Australia, the cafe culture is quite different to uh, the rest of the world. Um, everyone, a lot of people go out for breakfast and, and have coffee in the morning. So um, cafe kitchens can produce some really good food down there. Um, so I, I started at a, at a cafe called 
uh, Ed Brown's, and then I kind of hopped around, ended up at one called Dizenkoff, which I think is still there in Auckland, um, until I was about 21, where I, I always wanted to, I wanted to get over to Europe. So 21, I packed my bags, went to Europe, um, only really working in cafes, hadn't really worked in many restaurants. I landed in London and I worked in a restaurant called Tom's Kitchen by a chef, Tom Atkins. And I worked there for a couple of years. He was a pretty hard chef. He was pretty tough, um, but he was a very good chef. And his, his twin brother, Rob Atkins, actually ran that kitchen for a long time. Um, Rob was also a very good chef. And I, I think Rob's in the state somewhere. I think, I think Chicago. I could be completely wrong. Um, anyway, Rob was a good guy and a great chef. And Tom was a great chef. I didn't have heaps to do with Tom, to be perfectly honest, but... Um, he was kind of busy running the other restaurants and I think he left his brother Rob to, to man the one that I looked after which was Tom's Kitchen in, in Chelsea. So I did that for a couple of years and then I moved on to a restaurant called The Roof Gardens in Kensington which was owned by Richard Branson. Um, big kitchen, big brigade, um, clash with the head chef there um, uh, which we don't really need to get into. Uh, but it didn't last a particularly long time, I think six to eight months or something, and I was, I was, I'd left that kitchen. I actually left that kitchen and went back to Tom's kitchen, so, um, and I, but I didn't, I didn't last much longer, I think I did another six months or something at Tom's kitchen, before I went to a restaurant called e &O in Notting Hill. So e &O, uh, if you if you know Notting Hill, it was next to the bookshop which was the bookshop that was on the movie Notting Hill. And it was an Asian concept restaurant, um, busy, like full of celebs, full of like cool people. Uh, Adele lived in the apartments above it. Jamiroquai lived around the corner. He was always in there. Um, I'd always see him at the pub. And I was having cheeky pints on my breaks. Um, and it was literally across the road from that famous bookshop that was on the movie. So there was hordes of tourists every day taking photos out there. But it was a real, it was a real London kind of hotspot when I was there. And we were really, it was a really busy restaurant. I was there for maybe 18 months um, before I left there. And a friend who I'd met, his name was Dave. He was a sous chef at Tom's Kitchen. He went to open a restaurant called The Botanist back in Chelsea. Um, so when they opened that, he, he said, "Can you try to come work with us?" So I left Great Eastern Diner. Um, Eastern and Oriental and went to the botanist. I didn't last long there at all. It was pretty chaotic and I don't know, it just wasn't for me that, that restaurant. Um, and, and back then, and I'm sure it's like now, people move around a lot. You kind of, you follow people around. And But I didn't last, I didn't look for another job. I got a phone call from the exec chef of the group that ran e &O, which is the restaurant I came from. And he had, they had another restaurant called Eastern and Oriental in Shoreditch, who, um, who was looking for a head chef. So he offered me a head chef role. Uh, I was 24, had my first head chef role. Far too young, I, I know. Uh, and, for, and mainly too young from a management's perspective. So I think, I'm sure it's just, it's just as bad now, but back then no one ever gave you management training. You got lots of, you learned, learned how to cook. I knew how to cook. I knew how to um, take a stock take. I knew how to count costs. I knew all that stuff. I didn't know how to manage people uh, and, I, and all I did was just manage people how how I was always managed which is very authoritarian very militant um, and it didn't end well I, I mean I had a, a revolving kind of brigade of chefs that came through um, and you know it was it was kind of up and down it was really busy and then you know it was really hard and then you'd kind of have a really quiet week and <clears throat> it just wasn't a great deal, a, a, a lot of fun. My first kind of head chef role. I was there for, for, for kind of two years and then, oh, maybe not quite two years, maybe, you know, just over 18 months. And then coming into the last Christmas season that I was there, I, um, I, excuse me, I decided I had enough, so I, I um I actually got asked to go and open a sushi concept for someone. So I resigned basically, you know, coming into the Christmas period and said my last day would be New Year's Eve. Um, but I met a lot of cool people in that restaurant, I'll give it that. It was a fun restaurant. We're in Shoreditch. It was pre-GFC or, you know, just post-GFC or, you know, there was a lot of bankers around with a lot of money. Um, 
you know, and, and I was the head chef of one of the cool restaurants in town, so I knew all the bouncers and the clubs, um, you know, and we had a good time, right? We, we certainly, you know, one of the things that didn't help the fact that I wasn't doing a particularly great job looking back on it was the fact that I was just partying really hard. Um, not big hair, feel like my unduckies. So yeah, it's like partying really hard and anyway, that all came to an end, I left that job. The whole sushi concept thing fell away and I ended up working at a restaurant or a gastro pub that kind of became the flavour of the month <coughs> for a while in London there. There was a couple of um, like groups of, of restaurants that started buying up these like historic cool old pubs and basically turned them into what were called gastro pubs, so basically restaurants that had nice pubs and nice bars. So I worked at a restaurant called The Orange for a while, and quite a while, maybe, maybe almost two years as well. The Orange was a beautiful pub. I think it was like three floors, you know, it had like four boutique hotel rooms. I had like a pizza oven and um, like a, a PDR, private dining room. Uh, and I was there, the head chef there was, I, I took a step back, so I went from being a head chef to being back to being a sous chef. And the, the head chef was a guy called Nigel, who I got on really well with. Um, and the exec chef was a guy called Paul, pretty sure, yeah, Paul, Paul Wilson, yep. And I got on really well with him. So I did that. And, and I, I went into that business with the, knowing that I was probably starting to, to tran you know, think about transitioning back to this part of the world. I thought, oh, let's do one last job here in London, and then I might jump on a plane and go home. So I did that for, yeah, 18 months. Uh, and really enjoyed my time there. We did some really good food and, and big numbers. We had a big brigade. Um, and it's kind of making me think of all these, you know, incredible people that I worked with and followed around and all these people that I've just, you know, you become like brothers and sisters in these kitchens because you spend so much time together. And with the most unlikely people, people that you'd never cross paths with normally. But So I, I left there and went to Australia. I went, we landed in Sydney. Uh, and I started working at a restaurant called Felix. So Felix was owned by the Mirabel Group. Mirabel Group's a big restaurant group in Sydney, owned by a guy called Justin Hems. They have a lot of venues, um, really cool venues, you know, like really beautiful fit outs. And Felix was a French brasserie, a very classic French brasserie. You know, big oyster bar, um, you know, big butt, you know, bar at the front and um, nice big pastry section. Uh, and I did that for a year, but I didn't love Sydney back then. I kind of, I think I'd come from London. Sydney was still on the up and coming when it came to food, and it very much felt like a place people were going to be seen as opposed to really like understanding food culture. So I left, I left Sydney and I moved to Melbourne. When I was in Melbourne, I started working at a restaurant called Gill's Diner. It was a one hat restaurant, uh, and I took over the head chef role there. Um, and it had a bakery attached with that beautiful bread. And I, so I was back in a head chef role. Um, and I, I, I didn't gel with the food at the start, so I kind of changed most of the food pretty quickly and um, just simplified a lot of it, you know, kind of made it a bit more, you know, like the name says, Gill's Diner, like it was a bit more kind of chill kind of food, stuff I love to cook, so, you know. Um, salads and steaks and you know there was a big pasta section um, there was a cool little restaurant um, that restaurant got sold about two years later to three Italian guys who kind of changed it into a, um, an Italian restaurant which is still there now I think but it became pretty often it was you know the restaurant was sold and it was sold to two chefs and a front of house guy it was pretty obvious there was no room for me so I, uh, I left that role and I went and ran and, and opened a restaurant called Entrecote for Jason Jones um, in this alley at the top of, you know, the Paris end of Melbourne. Um, and the notorious, you know, since I learned since that, that the site that this restaurant opened was notorious, right? Like nothing's ever worked there. Um, I didn't last long there because, the, you know, it, it was just wasn't busy enough and I just, it's like, oh, this isn't going to work. And the whole time, I was always a customer at a big cafe in Melbourne called St. Ali. And I knew the owner, Sal, really well, just from going there. Sal was your classic, you know, restaurant entrepreneur. I reckon he's owned, I don't know, 
dozens and dozens of cafes brought and sold over his time as a as a as a restaurateur. <clears throat> now you always used to say, "Come work for me, come work for me," and I said, "I'll come work for you when the exec chef role of, of the whole Sailor Lee group comes up." And there was a guy called uh, Andy running it. Funnily enough, I've forgotten his last name. Anyway, he was he was always he did some great food too, Andy. Um, uh, and and actually, a guy who you might know as well from TikTok as, as a chef called Dobbers, who who's probably come up on TikTok and Instagram recently. Uh, he was he worked there as well. A whole bunch of people worked in that restaurant. Ben Cooper, who was now the group exec chef for Chinchins, um, Mr. Burger, he worked there for a while. It, heaps of people worked in that in that cafe. Anyway, that role came up. And I took it, I jumped at it. And, um, so I got it at Entrecot, went to St. Ali. Uh, and it was a beast, you know, it was this massive cafe. We would pump, we'd do like a thousand covers on, on the weekends of really good, you know, high-end cafe food. Um, every single celebrity under the sun was always there, you know, from Tarantino to, you know, all the local footy players to everyone and anyone. So... And then from there, we you know we had another couple of other little cafes that I had a little bit to do with, not much. Um, and then we we're opening, you know, we opened one in Jakarta, so I had to go back and back and forth from there a bit and kind of check up on those guys. We started opening one in Bali, and then that kind of fell, fell apart, so I was supposed to go there. And I was doing some consulting for a restaurant in Singapore. Um, but yeah, it was it was a it was a fun time, but it was pretty hectic. Um, at that point, it was kind of when I started realizing I was probably having a bit of an issue with, with booze. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I partied a lot in the UK and then kind of tried to stop when I got to Australia. Didn't stop successfully, kind of kept going. And I thought at some point, you know, all right, this is an issue. I need to get some help. So I, I put my hand up and asked for some help uh, and, and, and logged myself into a rehab um, and... You know, hats off, and you know, huge thank you to uh, to Sal and the whole team at Saint Ali. There was no questions asked, no issues. It was like you go do what you need to do, and we'll, we'll talk once you get out. Like they paid me the whole time. There was no, you know, no no questions asked. It was like, yep, no worries, mate. Go do what you need to do, and call me when you're done. So I took about two months off. I went to did a, um, a detox program for a week, and then I went to do a 30-day retab program. I <clears throat> my best mate's wedding was the uh, the day after I, my 30 days was up, you know, and there was an I was you know on the groom's party, you know, it was, um, it was no question in my head that I was not going to that wedding, you know that there was also like no pressure, you know, all my mates were like don't do what you need to do if you can't make it that's cool like we get it. But no, no, I left rehab and I flew to New Zealand and I made that wedding. Um, and I haven't looked back since. I haven't had a drink in almost seven years now. So, um, and I have no intention of it. Um, so when I, but once I got back, I kind of continued working for St. Ali. I ran, well, I didn't run. I, I didn't do like, I didn't go straight back into the exec chef role. It was going to be too stressful. I kind of needed to ease back into work. So I, I just kind of did some work for uh, a restaurant, a cafe that they also owned called Auction Rooms, um, and then and then I got offered a job. Um, someone called me a recruiter <coughs> to take over the corporate executive chef role for Emirates Leisure Retail. Uh, so I took over. I, I interviewed. That interview process took a while. It took about six months, to be honest. Um, and then I had this job, this massive job. You know, Emirates Leisure Retail at its peak was over 100 venues. We had a, group, like a chain of cafes that we had, which was half franchise, half corporate owned. And then we had about, you know, 30 restaurants and, 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 um, and bars based in airports around Australia and New Zealand. So I took over that role. It was a big role. You know, I had about 17 exec chefs underneath me and one in every state. And I was traveling a lot. I was doing, you know, Easily doing 100 flights a year. I was all over Australia. Um, we opened a whole bunch of venues in Auckland Airport. Um, you know, there was times where I was flying into Auckland Airport. We would go and open a venue and I'd fly out. I'm from Auckland, right? Like I had a lot of people I knew in Auckland. I was there for a week. I didn't leave the airport. There was a hotel airport. I'd fly in, check my bags into the hotel airport, go to work <laughs> for a week, jump on a plane and come back home. 
So it was a super crazy job, but, and I had, I had no intention of leaving. You know, like that job was a lot of fun. I quite enjoyed the travel side of it, even though I whinged about it a little bit. Um, and I just enjoyed the, you know, I wasn't on the tools every day. You know, I think at a certain point in a chef's career, you're kind of looking to get off the tools. Mind, I, I certainly know I was. Then COVID hit, uh, and it was a pretty scary time. We, you know, all of a sudden we were asked to let all of our casual workers go, and there was a lot of them, um, you know, like thousands. We had to let them all go, which is pretty tough. And then it was, uh, you know, it's like, oh, hang on, I have to make a whole bunch of people redundant here. And then the next minute it was like, oh, hang on, looks like I, I think I might be in trouble here. Uh, so the, the, I was on the senior leadership team of Emirates Leisure Retail. There's seven of us on the senior leadership team that were reported into the managing director. And then one day the managing director was like, can I have a chat? And I was like, oh, here we go. So, and he, he basically, he was lovely, and I still talk to, to Justin a lot now. Um, well, not a lot, but I still talk to him. He's a really nice guy. And he said, look, we can take you, you know, we, we're going to have to make some cuts here. You can go to part-time, or you can just take a redundancy. And the writing was on the wall. It was like, you know, it was the start of this thing. I knew it wasn't going to happen quickly. I took the redundancy and, and just got out of there. So, excuse me. Which is tough to process, I think, that, you know, I think it was tough. COVID was tough at the start for a lot of people. But it was tough because, you know, I wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, I don't think I was perfect, but, you know, my performance wasn't bad. And all of a sudden, I was without a job. And it was the first time in my life that I, you know, one of the blessings about being a chef is that you can, doesn't matter where you're in the world, you can find work. You can always find work. <coughs> that was the first time. My mouth is super dry. I apologize. It was the first time in my my career. I thought I'm not going to have a job. Like I'm, I'm just going to struggle to find one. So, so at the same time, Caitlin was contracting for a company, and it was pretty clear that her contract wouldn't get renewed because of you know what was going on. So I just said, "Babe, let's pack the car and come to the sunny coast." So that's what we did. We packed the car and we we drove to the sunny coast. And when we got here, I didn't do much for six months. I kind of bummed around a bit. Um, deliberately, I thought, you know, we were in a fortunate enough position to move into Catton's parents' house. Uh, there wasn't heaps of jobs going. Um, it was kind of the first time in my life I just stopped and didn't do much for a while. So I just kind of enjoyed it, just absorbed it. We did a lot of camping. You know, we hung out a lot. And then I started getting bored. So I started doing consulting, a few odds and ends. Um, and then, you know, I kind of was like, ah, oh, I might start, you know, I kind of saw this TikTok, like, just kicking off. And con you know, chef or food creators just getting crazy amounts of traction and views. And I thought, I can do that. So I started making videos. And then pretty quickly it was like, oh, okay, I'm going to have a good crack at this. I decided I was going to make videos every day. I was just going to make, make a video every day and post it. And pretty quickly, within six months, I had like a million followers. It was wild. But not too far after that, the... The guys at uh, Kilcoy Global Foods reached out and wanted to know if I wanted to run their test kitchen. I went and had a look at the kitchen and I was like, yeah, I want to run this. <laughs> and I said to them, look guys, I, I make content as well on the side. And they were like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. No worries. I don't think they quite realized, well, not, I don't think anyone realized what was going to happen. But So I started running that kitchen full time and I was also making content full time. I was effectively working two jobs, but I wasn't making any money off the content yet. So... And deliberately, I didn't want to start taking brand deals until I'd kind of quite established myself. Um, but it wasn't too long after after I you know started, probably six months after around that kitchen, that you know it was pretty obvious that this content thing was going to be a permanent thing. So you know I kind of said to them, "I'll give you to the end of the year," and then um, that was the end of last year. I'll give you to the end of the year, and then you know I'll have to part ways and focus on this content thing full time. And they said, no, 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 stay on board and then we'll find someone to run the kitchen and you can kind of just be a brand ambassador um, <coughs> and we'll use you when we're having big parties and stuff like that or we need to, you know, you know invite dignities around or whatever um, and just kind of um, still be the executive chef but there's no need to come to the kitchen. So, and, and that's the role that I still play today with them. So it's been a pretty wild journey. Uh, I... I, when I started the content thing, I'm pretty driven and pretty like focused. I thought it would kind of get to this, but I didn't think it would happen as fast. So 
we're kind of pretty much bang on. I think it was like you know, November the 11th I posted my first TikTok video. We're two years in. I think we're almost at 14 million followers across all the platforms um, you know, and continue to growing. Um, and you know who knows what's going to happen next year, but um, but I'm excited. Should be a bit of fun. <coughs> I don't know why my throat is so dry, but so yeah, it's been a it's been a crazy couple of years, but I couldn't be more thankful. So um, and it's because of you guys for tuning in and watching on on all the channels. You know, without without the audience, this is nothing. So you know, the goal has always been to inspire home cooks to be better cooks and to. Uh, and just to share my love and passion for food and that just always needs to be the goal and uh, be proud of what we do so that'll be the, the, the journey that we go on next year through what formats and mediums I'm not sure but it will still be all focused around that that's like you know inspiring people to cook better food and sharing food stories because I think that's also something that I'm really passionate about as well but Anyway, Legends, I'm going to sign off for the day. I've got a little bit more work I need to get done um, tonight. And then tomorrow we've got some shorts to shoot. Hopefully the weather clears up. We've got another day of shorts on Thursday. And then on Friday I'm going to do some work around here to start getting set up for when the studio moves over next week. So, hope you'll have a good night and we will see you in the morning to eat my oats. Peace.